At the end of the sixth season in mid-1969, Doctor Who was at a crossroads. Patrick Troughton and his companions had just left, exhausted after making 40 or so episodes of the show every year. Behind the scenes turmoil, falling ratings and approaching changeover to full colour for BBC One made it seem like it was the time to end the series. But without a replacement ready to go, the BBC would give the go-ahead for another season of Doctor Who. Producer Derek Sherwin began the search for an actor to star in the first colour season, now with a new Earthbound format that had been tested the previous year with Unit's debut story, The Invasion. The rationale was that the series would be more grounded in reality, less goofy, and the budget could be better managed. Not us, sir, them. The has got to be Another major change was that the show would now see a cut in the number of episodes produced, from 40 a year to a more manageable 25 for the 1970 season. At the time he was cast, John Pertwee was an unlikely choice for the title role. He was mainly known as a comedy actor and had never done any serious acting. When he asked his new bosses how he should play the role, Pertwee was told to just be himself. Taking this challenge on board, this season would strike a very straight-faced tone with only occasional comic relief. Pertwee would go on to play the title role for five years, and to this day, his is still the most unique take on the role. The third Doctor walks into any situation and owns it, with very little deference to those already in the room. Faced with a bureaucrat or a military type, the Doctor attacks with withering remarks, condescension and extreme sarcasm. Sartorially, the new Doctor comes across as a dandy with his frilly shirts and velvet smoking jackets and cloaks. It's a style we now associate with Austin Powers, but the Third Doctor was one of several contemporary heroes with a similar dress sense. The Third Doctor was also a man of action, loving vehicles of all types, and was also able to defend himself with Venusian Aikido. The vehicles would come in handy, since the TARDIS was not working, and the earliest the Time Lords say they can fix it is 1973. Having been sentenced by the Time Lords to exile on Earth, the Doctor would swan about in Bessie, an Edwardian roadster that he took great pleasure in tuning. I don't even know your name. Uh, Smith. Dr. John Smith. During his exile, the Doctor became the scientific advisor to the United Nations Intelligence Task Force, better known as UNIT, a military group tasked with investigating unusual phenomena, Hail Hydra. Heading UNIT is Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, a military man who knows he needs the Doctor's help, but really wishes he could solve these alien problems in his own way. However, as the series is called Doctor Who and not The Brigadier Blows Shit Up, you can guess who usually saves the day. The Brigadier is played with great gusto by Nicholas Courtney. He starts off by being quite rational and undaunted by alien incursions, but in later years would find it easier to be a skeptic and shoot first and ask questions later. For this season, the Doctor is joined by an actual scientist, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, who was being briefed on a potential job as unit scientific advisor when the Doctor turns up and the Brigadier offers him that job. I think you'll find the salary is quite adequate. Right in front of Liz, who then has to settle for being his assistant. Really? Of course, the show is called Doctor Who and not The Liz Shaw Mysteries, so that kind of makes sense. Liz Shaw, played by classically trained Carolyn John, is a lot less childlike than most of the female companions of previous years, and she makes a great foil for the Doctor. Liz takes no guff from him or the Brigadier. Don't try anything. It's all right, I won't hurt you. And assists the Doctor in a technical way that no previous companion had ever managed. Spearhead from Space starts off the new series in style, a series of curious incidents involving large numbers of meteorites landing in the same area is investigated by UNIT. <laughs> UNIT troops do find an abandoned police box and an unconscious man in the woods. Taken to the local hospital, the man is discovered to have an unknown blood type and two hearts but Lethbridge Stewart is disappointed to realise that this is not the Doctor that he recognises. After an attempted kidnapping by unknown assailants, the Doctor escapes from the hospital in a stolen car to retrieve the TARDIS from Unit HQ.
eventually. Meanwhile, the meteorites have all been collected by their owners and taken to a plastics factory, where an alien consciousness called the Nestines is creating plastic bodies for itself, autons, to use to take over the Earth. And with that, Doctor Who becomes Quatermass for the next few years. Spearhead from Space is a taut thriller caught between the late 1960s and early 70s in terms of style, and is slicker than it should have been because it was made on 16mm film. A strike at the BBC Television Centre meant the serial was in danger of complete cancellation until it was saved by a last-minute decision to mount the shoot on location with a film unit. After this story's completion, producer Derek Sherwin departed to work on another series, and former actor and director Barry Letts took over as producer. The Autons are pretty cool enemies with their blank faces and guns coming out of their hands. Of course, if they look familiar to younger viewers... When the new Earthbound format was decided on, writer Malcolm Hulk announced that going forth, the series really only had two stories, Mad Scientist and Alien Invasion. His first script attempted to do something different. Doctor Who and the Silurians involves a unit investigation into problems at an underground research centre in Derbyshire. Absenteeism, mental breakdowns and serious power drains are eventually linked to some nearby caves where, it turns out, an ancient reptilian race called the Silurians have awoken from hibernation and found out that their planet has been overrun by primitive ape men. Even worse, their electricity has been disconnected because the bill hasn't been paid for 300,000 years. Outraged and vowing to take back control, the Silurians disagree amongst themselves about the best way to deal with the humans. The old Silurian wants a deal, and the young Silurian wants no deal. The Doctor offers his services to barter a peace treaty, but the young Silurian has prevailed in the leadership contest and unleashed a deadly virus to wipe out man. The Doctor has to try and find a cure before everyone drops dead and stop the inevitable conflict between the humans and the Silurians. Doctor Who and the Silurians displays the more mature tone the series was aiming for, with precious little comic relief, and everyone playing things absolutely straight and deadpan. The Silurians is also one of those early occasions in the series where the creatures are not portrayed as mindless killers, but a race with their own culture and their own agenda and their own right to survival. So their ultimate fate saddens the Doctor. We would of course meet the Silurians' aquatic cousins later in the Pertwee era, and the Silurians would appear later in the Peter Davison era, and of course in the modern series, where one of them, Madame Vastra, would become a semi-regular and a fan favourite. Doctor Who and the Silurians also marks the first time the series would use the new chroma key process, known within the BBC as Colour Separation Overlay. And it's done quite effectively and used sparingly and with restraint. There are some brief appearances of a massive underground dinosaur keyed into scenes with the actors. A heavy dinosaur suit was created before Barry Letts realised every large and terrifying creature could be made infinitely shittier and less impressive if they just used small puppets instead. One other thing to look out for in this serial is an early role by future Blake 7 star Paul Darrow as Captain Hawkins. Ambassadors of Death, originally written by David Whittaker for Patrick Troughton's Doctor, but heavily rewritten by Malcolm Hulk, involves a missing British spacecraft and the Doctor's intervention into a long-winded plot to use alien ambassadors to create a pretext for war with the same aliens. And It makes about as much sense as an apprentice Hibachi chef who's scared at the sight of their own blood. The ambassadors thrive on radiation, but are also lethal to touch and can't communicate with humans without translator devices. As luck would have it, some conspiratorial types have one of these devices and are using it to control the aliens as shock troops. It's a convoluted storyline and has some gaping plot holes throughout its run. Enlivened by some nice action scenes and an extended sequence where John Pertwee is shot off into space. Final countdown. Now. Ten. Nine. It manages to keep hustling over its seven episodes. Paul Lee Shaw, however, gets locked up for most of the story and forced to work on the alien translator device, while the Brigadier is constantly nobbled by ranking army superior General Carrington, who's able to lie as convincingly as anything you'll see plastered on the side of a bus. Ambassadors is a bit slight, but it's one of the few conspiracy-themed stories in the classic show. In general, the plot is garbled. Any interesting plot and character points are smothered by a script that spends way too much time papering over the cracks. Ambassadors does introduce one of the series' most iconic elements. The scream that would introduce the end credits. It was so popular that it gets used at the start of each episode as well.
Inferno by writer Don Horton was originally a simple story about an attempt to drill into the Earth's core to harness some made-up energy source, but the production team felt there wasn't enough script to fill seven episodes. A flash of inspiration from script editor Terence Dix involves the Doctor being sent into a parallel universe where the same drilling project is more advanced and about to go horribly wrong, unleashing primal forces that threaten to destroy the Earth. Complicating matters is the fact that in the parallel universe, it's inhabited by evil versions of the Doctor's friends, with the fascist brigade leader and section leader Shaw unwilling to listen to the Doctor's warnings of impending doom. Oh, and some green stuff turns people into dodgy Halloween costumes. The Doctor attempts to stop the drilling, but is ignored, and all he can do is watch the countdown to disaster. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have a penetration zero. Even with this brilliant addition to the script, Inferno is at least one episode too long, and episode six in particular doesn't really move the story forward at all. Overall, it's an interesting take on the 60s style end of the world disaster film like A Crack in the World. It's the only Pertwee story directed by Douglas Camfield, previously responsible for many of the better made stories of the 1960s. Camfield collapsed during studio sessions and the story was completed by Barry Letts based on Camfield's notes. The series was a critical and rating success, and the series cancellation wouldn't come up again until the mid-1980s. Letts and Pertwee felt while actress Carolyn John was very good, the character of Liz Shaw didn't fulfill the function of a companion, that is, someone the Doctor could stop and explain the plot to. Carolyn John, having found the role limited, and who had also become pregnant, left the series in between seasons, her absence in the next season covered by a line of dialogue about Liz returning to Cambridge. Goodbye, Liz. I shall miss you, my dear. Oh, no, Doctor. Liz! Good grief. The next season would see a few subtle tweaks to the formula that would build on strengths of this season, but establish a template that would serve the series well for several years to come. We'd also meet the Doctor's best enemy, the Master. So if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, and be sure to check out some of our other videos.